Kia ora, Kiwi Kodja here and welcome to episode 72, Kaiapoia, the pa at Kaiapoi. Now, I had the opportunity to visit Christchurch on other business, but went early to do some visiting and droning of pa and finally got to visit Kaiapoia. This episode will cover briefly the various iwi in Waipounamu, South Island, then set the scene for the next few episodes by looking at the Kaiapoia pa in as much detail as we can. So what about iwi in the South Island? Now, the original inhabitants were the Waitaha, who traced their whakapapa to the Te Arawa canoe and had slowly migrated to the unpopulated South Island, establishing themselves around 1570. They were displaced or absorbed by the Ngāti Māmoi, who traced their roots back to the Herotonga region. The Naitahu are descendants of the Takitimu, Karahapo, and Matahorua canoes. They made their way down from Poverty Bay via Whanganui Atara and then invaded the South Island. The defeat and absorption of Ngāti Māmoi took them over 30 years of conflict and was finally achieved around 1700. They were led by Turakao Tahi. It was he who established the Kaiapoia Pa where it is today. It was the central pa for Naitahu and strategically located, close to the source of greenstone to the west and a central storage area for the abundant resources for both the southern and northern parts of Waiponamu. Kaiapoia was the Wall Street of its time. It was the main trading centre for Pōnamu, and from this trade, Pōnamu had spread throughout the Motu, and Naitahu were the gatekeepers. By the 1820s, the Pā had a countrywide reputation. It was effectively the capital of the South Island. It was rich in detailed carving and a Pā of great standing. From its trading, it had gained muskets, powder and shot, but not in the quantities of their northern rivals. The problem with the formidable Kaiapoia Pa was that it became coveted by others, and those others were acquiring muskets at a greater rate. It would only be a matter of time before this resulted in conflict. In the late 1820s, Naitahu acknowledged this reality, and the Pa, considered unconquerable using conventional weapons, was upgraded to withstand the new threat from muskets. Now, what do we know of the Kaiapoia Pa around the late 1820s, early 1830s? Well, the information from the Reverend James West Stack's book, Kaiapoia, The Story of a siege is probably the most detailed. If you remember from episode 70 on Wesleydale, James Stack did that overnight dash for help. Well, he was the father of James West Stack. The Reverend James West Stack got most of his information from Peter de Hori, considered by Stack to be the last night Tahu Tohanga. Stack was fluent in Te Reo and spent many years in the Kaiapoi area from 1859 onwards. Another source is a famous survey of the site done by Augustus MacDonald in 1870. MacDonald, 27, was a professional civil engineer who arrived in Christchurch in June 1869 and surveyed Kaiapoia the following April. In April 2023, 153 years later, I visited the site. It was a beautiful day. It's a place I've always wanted to visit. To soak in these places, you need to know the stories, and Kaiapoia has a few, two of which will make up future episodes. Now, I've superimposed McDonald's map onto Google Earth. It's an excellent fit. According to Stack, there were two gates on the south wall, the Kaitangata Gate on the southeast and the Hiakareli Gate on the southwest, here and here. 
Stack says that outside the Kaitata Gate there was a musket-proof tower that gave good visibility out beyond the main palisades to the south, the most likely direction for any attack. On the western side is the Huirapa Gate, with a bridge across the swamp, so that's here. On MacDonald's map, there are two other gaps in the Western Wall. These three gaps were used by residents to collect their water. The water flows from the stream down through here and makes its way out to the Rakahuri River, or the Ashley River, then out to sea. Stack indicates this flat area was for sport and large gatherings. At the northern end of it, there was a huge communal fata called Matukurangi, which sat on the stump of an ancient totra tree. The Foranui was here, who was called Pukukura. Stack said all buildings faced north and had cooking areas and food storage fata close by. The canoe landing areas are also signposted. The first was Tauranga Ki Uta, the other Manurewa, which may have been further south down here. On MacDonald's map, and also stated in Stack's book, was the Tohanga area, which was down here. The Tohanga had their altar somewhere in this area. There was a large unpalisaded area at the north of the pa. MacDonald says that there were two urupa here, one for each hapu in the pa. There is no sign of it today, but MacDonald's map indicates significant earthworks in this area. This area was the site of a more ancient pa. I shall talk about these markings here in future episodes. MacDonald, on his map, indicates where the swamp was back in 1870. Today, the swamp has been drained and areas where you see trees is where it existed back then. Let's get up in the air and we'll take off from here and head north. So here we are, over the old ancient par heading north towards the southwest corner of Kaipoia. The gap near the tree is the Hiakariri Gate. As we go along the western side, you can see the flat area to the right used for sports and gatherings. We are coming up to the Hui Rapa Gate, which had a 20 metre bridge going across the swamp to the left. Around here was the northernmost opening in the palisade for water gathering. And then we come down to the area where the Tohunga lived with their attendants. On the right is the area described by MacDonald as having two urupa. You can see the flow of the swamp out to the Rakahuri River to the north. Well, a lot's changed in 200 years. The palisaded area covers approximately 5.7 acres. The ancient pa, a further 3.2 acres, and the northern unpalisaded section, 2.2 acres. Now, I've done some work with a 3D package, so let's bring that in. Now, the water you see is swamp with vegetation, not the smooth sea as shown, and the land would be festooned with flax and native plants, so try and imagine that. The layout of the foray would have been far more organic than my modelling, but this gives a feel for how it may have been. OK, let's zoom down and get a closer look. The mound in the foreground is my representation of the altar with a Pumamu idol. 
Altars took many forms, but invariably they had a facility for burning things. Here we have the whare nui. This is called pukukura. There is the large fatu to the right, called matukurangi. And around the whare nui would be the whare kai and the whare umu. On McDonald's map were a number of depressions believed to be used for preparing hangi. I've placed them as per his map. Now remember, this part is over 100 years old, so probably has mature trees scattered here and there. Stack says that all the buildings face north. The large building with the man in the doorway is Fite Rea, which I believe is a place of learning. The swamp was quite dense, but Stack said that small to medium canoes could navigate it. There were two landing areas. This one is called Tauranga Kiuta, and the other, further south, called Manurewa. A power of such significance would have had a carving area, which I've placed here. With the river flowing north on the other side of the pa where water gathering took place, I have placed toilets along this side. The log on which the person is squatting is the pei pei, and the peg they hold for support is the pei hamuti. The swamp would have been full of eels, which I'm sure would have congregated around these pei pei. I've placed some pens for pigs in a handy area to the kitchen in Whare Nui. The long whare on the right I've imagined to be for slaves. Did the slaves sleep together? Or with their masters? I don't know. Here is the flat area. I've placed 500 people here doing a haka, just for relativity. We are about to fly over the Hui Rapa Gate. McDonald's map indicates there was a musket-proof watchtower guarding the bridge and water gatherers. This is another water gathering gate, with McDonald's map indicating a narrow footbridge across the swamp. This is the Hia Kariri Gate. Notice the double palisading on the south wall. McDonald states that at the bottom between the palisading was packed with sand and flax to stop musket balls. This would have been part of the musket proofing for the par. McDonald on his map indicates complex earthworks outside the Hiakariri gate. The exact purpose escapes me. According to Stack, this is the Kaitangata Gate, also shown as the musket-proof lookout. Stack says that there was a large trench that went across the south side, but on McDonald's map this is not indicated, so I'm not sure what's happening there. Here I have assumed that the ancient pa is used to run pigs. Why not? The area at the southern end here was Knobsville, where Rangatira had their forays. Some pretty large, able to sleep over 100. Many chiefs from afar would have their own forays here for when they visited. Okay, let's sweep around the par again, this time with my FPV drone, and then we'll call it quits.
And look at the crappy little road that you have to come down. The car got dirty just by coming down this road. You'd think they'd put tar seals at least down to here. Anyway. I'm done. Kaya Poya, you didn't let me down.